Today's episode contains some graphic topics, so I've taken out as many of the graphic words as I possibly can, the foul language, but you won't have any problems figuring out what's going on. All right, here we go. Today we're going to talk about Brother Bilal. We're going to break down his body language and tell you what we think about it. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. Yeah, so this was from an interview with Tasha Kay, and this is Brother Bilal apparently has known Will Smith for 38 years, most of that being his friend, and he's got a lot of kind of explosive things to say about Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith, and this video went on for a long time, and there's a lot of language in here that we're going to clean up, so get ready for some missing words. So it was, it was Will the one that stepped out of his marriage. What Jada didn't really have to yeah, do was anything, that, it was, it's, but, that, it was, but be it, herself. Yeah, I mean, much. they were already going through it because there were some alleged things that said that, um, you know, uh, Cherie caught Will in bed with Benny Medina. So, who? yeah, uh, Benny Medina. Benny Medina is who the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air is based off. And he's a, you know, big talent manager. You know, he had J-Lo, Puffy, a, a bunch of them. He had Will at one point. And, you know, he's a known homosexual as well, you know. Um, and, you know, he presents that. So, uh yeah. Did but, you ever talk to Sheree about that to get confirmation? Um, well, I didn't need confirmation because, you know, I, I saw the interaction between Will and Benny Medina. So it, it's a it's a funny. What story. was their interaction? So, so it, this is crazy. So now yeah. here's the scene. I'm coming from Philly, the streets of Philly, but I'm coming back and forth to Los Angeles. Right. Okay. So their cult, that entertainment culture mm, is different. Talking. Yeah. I'm, so, I know you don't drink. No, no. I'm a drink for you. OK. Go ahead. And um, so I'm, I'm hanging out at the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you know, as I do when I go out there. And, you know, I'm in Will's dressing room. There's a bunch of guys from Philly or whatever the case may be. And, uh, you know, Benny Medina hollers down the hall, well, I'm going to come see you in a minute. So, you know, uh, so he comes up there in a few minutes and he pokes his lips out like he's going to kiss Will. Right. And I'm like, oh, man, I got to beat the shit out of this. Do, I, do we do we pack him like, all right, well, I'll just wait because I'm you know, I, I don't know this culture. Mm -hmm. Right. And Will kissed this guy on the lips in front of you, in front of everybody. Nobody does nothing. And I'm like. No, no, I'm just thinking, I'm like a, a deer with the headlights. I'm like, nobody, see, did y'all just see that? And where I'm from, you know, that's not common. Maybe out in California it is. So it's a cultural And Billy thing. and Ben, he white, right? I know. Uh, Benny Medina's uh, black, but he's a very light, fair skinned Okay, I always um, thought he guy. was white. No, no. Okay. But yeah. But, I mean, uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Benny Medina is definitely. Uh, and so I, you I'm, saw him with your own eyes. With my own eyes. Was it a pucker? Yeah, of course. It was. It was. A, it was a kiss. I went with no long romantic movie kiss, but he kissed that man, and and I'm like nobody. Now this is before I work with Will. Okay, this you were just coming back and forth. I was coming back. You know, Will. He was married to Sheree, his first wife, Sheree, and but talking to Jada. Um, but at this time, it's like, um, like it's it, it's it's just weird. It's, it's hard. It's it's, it's hard to explain, but now with the knowledge and information I have, because what I did in the book was um, to, to pull more research was I hired two. All right, Greg, what do you got? So he starts off with some great illustrators and moving his hands. We say that Vray says the more larger and better your illustrators, and by that we mean the way your body punctuates your thoughts, then the more likely you're telling the truth. Look at him when he says back and forth. He's illustrating or Chase, you'll talk about body narration. But this illustrator is narrating his story. His eyes enlarged when he's asked, watch his eyes blow up when he's asked about Will and this guy, Bedina. And we'll see this. You expect there's something shocking. Your eyes blow up and look oversized because you got some residual emotion. Now, if we don't see that, then we wonder why. We'll see as we play through these videos what that means. His elbows are up and away from his body when he's describing the setup about when this happened. His body illustration is effeminate when he's talking about Bedina. That all fits his story. It's really good illustration. There's a bunching of his brow or a furrowing of his brow when he kissed a man that appears to show some emotion that he would have. So all residual again. Thumbs and fingers are extended and away from each other. That's a good indicator that he's got confidence in his story. And then he's adapting as he talked about how hard it is to understand but then he comes back out to open when he says, I need to do more research. So right out of the gate, for me, this is believable that he saw Will Smith kiss a guy. Does that mean he had a homosexual affair? Don't know. But 
I don't understand the situation. Don't know anything about that. But I think this guy's telling us what he believes he saw. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So uh, having been an actor uh, all over the world, I've kissed a lot of guys. And it's very normal. It's very, very ordinary. That's the way. That's the way it is. That's that's actors. That's the way we can be sometimes. Uh, so, but from from Greg's description there, you know, like uh, there's there's a there's a lot of movement in there. There's a lot of descriptors uh, in there. Sounds pretty good. But then for me, the hands come together in this steepling motion. This is a gesture that has to be learned. It has to be one that you put on on purpose. When was the time ever that you looked at, you, you know, a child growing up and you went, oh, my God, they, they've started to steeple already. You know, they're doing it. Look, they've, they've developed steepling. It's not, it's not a gesture that anybody develops at all. It's put on. So, you know, to your point, Greg, yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, there is some veracity, I think, in him saying he saw in Hollywood a guy kiss a guy. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's going to happen every day, whether they're homosexual or not homosexual. That's going to happen in Hollywood. Hollywood. Odd place. Odd place. And we'll get more into that as we go, as we go along. But why does he need this? throughout much of the telling, and we're not going to see this disappear a great deal. Why is he locked down into this? That's my question. When you've got a YouTube show, you kind of get used to people knowing information about you. In fact, if I Google my own name, lots of information comes up about me, but that's information that I'd like you to see. Also, information might come up that I don't want you to see. And so that's what I want to talk to you about and our sponsor, Aura. You see, data brokers are really happy to sell your private information to robocallers, to spammers, and all kinds of other people who will steal or hijack your identity in some way. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Now, brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it incredibly hard for you to do that. So here's the key. You can let Aura handle it for you. And you can try Aura free by using our special behavior panel link. But Aura also does so much more than protecting you from the online threats that you can't see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. So let Aura handle all of your online security for you and your family so you can get on with the things that you enjoy with a lot of peace of mind. Here's an opportunity to stop people profiting from your private information. Go to aura.com forward slash TBP to start your two-week free trial. Also in the link below. Click on it. Go take a look. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, this is the most shocking thing we've heard so far about Will since the big slap happened a couple of years ago, and which, and which makes this a pretty big deal. When I hear something like this, it reminds me of a UFO story or a Bigfoot story because it sounds so outlandish. It sounds impossible. It sounds like right out of the gate, you're like, what? And you can even tell it's affecting Tasha Kay the same way. She's like, I, I can hardly believe this because it sounds so big. But sometimes these things are, are so detailed when they're not true that you can you actually see the minutia of things happening. Now, I know this guy says he was there and all that, but the sincerity and the vigor that this thing was delivered with, that that sort of gives me a heads up about uh, that something might not be right here with what he what he's talking about. So let's talk about his behavior. Overall, his body language is open. His illustrators are on point, and they're timed well. And his voice is strong, his cadence is, is fairly solid, his tone is good. Everything sounds the way it should sound. His blink rate's fairly solid. And he adapts with that little touch to his face, but his leg keeps going up and down. So he's doing some adapting in there. He's, he's moving moving around a little bit. Um, and, and, and those are stress cues, especially when the part about uh, Benny Medina comes up. That's when 
we start seeing all those things really start happening the most. So what's inter interesting to me here is that barrier, barrier ring of his hands in front of him. He sort of, everything stays low at this point. It changes in the next video or so. But his, his video, his hands are almost locked down to the table. They move a little bit, but the this part of his forearm is is almost stuck to the table. That that gives me pause as well. So quite often when you see someone with their with their fingers together like this, that lets us know that they're probably not as confident as they should be with whatever they're telling us, if it was something that was true or they're trying to get some information a, a, across that's important or something we should trust. Because the, you, the more space you have between your fingers, the more confidence you usually have. That's, that's the way we see it. So I'm seeing a few little cues here that are showing stress and not much confidence as he's saying this especially with that barrier sitting there in front of him as well. So that that's two and one there, a barrier, and his fingers aren't very far apart at all. They're sort of stuck together. Um, and when he tells that story, his, his voice volume starts getting pretty low when he starts getting into the story part of it. And so his tone gets a little bit soft as well. And he's not moving a whole lot at this point from from anywhere, from his torso and the, and, and the, the parts we can see, I wish we could see more under the table, but there's a lot, a lot of close up on him, which is good too, because we can see his facial expressions and, and look for a little cues that'll tell, tell us if something's up or not. Um, so when you find, if you find yourself in a situation where you're hearing a story for the first time and it sounds like a UFO story or a Bigfoot story or something, that sounds really impossible. Look for these little cues we're talking about on here. And that might give you a heads up as to what's actually happening. So the key is observation, uh, especially in this one, because it, it gets iffy up in here. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with uh, you guys. And I think uh, this looks decent so far. We're gonna, we have some baseline stuff, maybe baseline, maybe it's not baseline. So uh, it's going to be interesting to find out. Mark, I've got a baby that's going to be born in about six weeks. And <laughs> when she is... If she does the if she does the gesture, you agree? Uh, we'll do a YouTube video Excellent. about it. Totally, yeah. totally. <laughs> get get the I want that moment captured. I want it. it. <laughs> so this guy is. Uh, if you're at all like me, uh, then you need like a 10 second rundown of what the hell we're looking at. This guy's apparently Will Smith's former friend and assistant. He's on this podcast, and it's about to get pretty thick with some celebrity trash talking and some gossip stuff. And the Smiths have publicly denied all these claims. They made a statement that they're taking legal action uh, against what they say are these malicious and false statements. This video has every single hallmark of sensationalism and a just a campaign with a very clear goal of harm and malice here. But one thing I want you to write down right now, if you're taking notes during this episode, I want you to just to write down three words. Keep referring back to these as you listen closer and closer to the videos coming up. So social belonging and status or status. Those three words, because they are going to be interwoven through every video that we watch tonight. Uh, there's use of uncorroborated information here. What the alleged things to start casting doubt on Will. Then there's cultural and personal bias. And he's saying coming from Philly the streets of Philly could be an attempt to frame that behavior as abnormal, unacceptable to help us start seeing it as more suspicious. There's a lack of direct evidence. He admits to not confirming some of the claims. He says like, well, I didn't need confirmation because, you know, I saw the interaction and all that and bases his conclusions on personal interpretations of an observed behavior here and then goes on a podcast to say that it's fact. So it might be suggestive of a smear campaign as it relies heavily here, just in this video, on subjective interpretations instead of facts. The storytelling style with details like, I'm going to beat the crap out of this person, these dramatic responses, is designed to engage and shock the listener. That's why you hear a lot of these vocal changes, in my opinion, and it's a sensationalist approach. And it's used in smear campaigns. It's also used in places where people are trying to sell a book. So he focuses on some very specific incidents and perceptions without providing any context. No context means there's a narrative. When you don't hear background and context and reasons, there's a narrative. Every detail is to achieve one goal. And you've 
I'll wrap this up here. If you listen to anyone speaking, anybody for a minute or two, and just use this one question to hear what they're saying, all you have to ask is, what do they want to happen in my head with the language that they're using? Or to phrase it a different way, how does this person want me to internally react to what they're saying based on how they're talking right now? That's all I got. Point out one thing, culture matters and street culture matters into how people communicate and all that. We all understand that. What we're looking for are deviations from what this guy is normally doing. And Chase, I think it's a good call out there because that culture is different from my culture and your culture and all that. But at the same time, it has some rules and some commonality that you look for deviations in. One of those tape replays. That's so it was it was Will the one that stepped out of his marriage? What Jada didn't really have. To yeah, do it was anything, that. It was, it's but, that it was, but be it, herself. Yeah, I mean much. they were already going through it because there were some alleged things that said that um, you know uh, Cherie caught Will in bed with Benny Medina. So who? Yeah, uh, Benny Medina. Benny Medina is who the Fresh Prince of Bel Air is based off, and he's a you know big talent manager. You know he had J Lo, Puffy, a, a bunch of them. He had Will at one point, and you know he's a known homosexual as well. You know, um, and you know he presents that. So uh, yeah. Did but, you ever talk to Sheree about that to get confirmation? Um, well, I didn't need confirmation because you know I, I saw the interaction between Will and Benny Medina. So it's a it's a funny. What story. was their interaction? So, so it, this is crazy. So now yeah. here's the scene. I'm coming from Philly, the streets of Philly, but I'm coming back and forth to Los Angeles, right? Okay. So their cult, that entertainment culture, mm, is keep different. Talking. Yeah, I'm, so, I know you don't drink. No, no, I'm a drink for you. Okay, go ahead. And um, so I'm I'm hanging out at the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, you know, as I do when I go out there, and you know, I'm in Will's dressing room. There's a bunch of guys from Philly or whatever the case may be, and. Uh, you know, Benny Medina hollers down the hall, well, I'm going to come see you in a minute. So, you know, uh, so he comes up there in a few minutes and he pokes his lips out like he's going to kiss Will. Right. And I'm like, oh, man, I got to beat the shit out of this. Do, I, do we do we pack him like, all right, well, I'll just wait because I'm you know, I, I don't know this culture. Mm -hmm. Right. And Will kissed this guy on the lips in front of you, in front of everybody. Nobody does nothing. And I'm like. No, no, I'm just thinking, I'm like a, a deer with the headlights. I'm like, nobody, see, did y'all just see that? And where I'm from, you know, that's not common. Maybe out in California it is. So it's a culture. And Billy thing. and Ben, he white, right? I know. Uh, Benny Medina's uh, black, but he's a very light, fair skinned Okay, I always um, thought he guy. was white. No, no. Okay. But yeah. But, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Benny Medina is definitely. Uh, and so I, you saw I'm, him with your own eyes. With my own eyes. Was it a pucker? Yeah, of course. It was. It was. A, it was a kiss. I went with no long romantic movie kiss, but he kissed that man, and and I'm like nobody. Now this is before I work with Will. Okay, this you were just coming back and forth. I was coming back. You know, Will. He was married to Sheree, his first wife, Sheree, and but talking to Jada. Um, but at this time, it's like, um, like it's it, it's it's just weird. It's it's hard. It's it's, it's hard to explain, but now with the knowledge and information I have, because what I did in the book was um, to, to pull more research was I hired two, two private investigator firms okay. right, to, to find out a lot of the allegations that were made be, uh, uh, towards people in Will's circle. OK. Right. And down um, as we get into the interview, I'll start to give you no, real good. examples Go ahead. Right, okay. of, of, of how that goes. Um, but seeing that, I, I said, wow. And I just didn't know how to take it coming from Philly and seeing something like that. But with my knowledge of now over having 30 years in the business, it's like, okay, this is the grooming. This is how the grooming starts. I didn't know that back then. But now, you know, having to spend decades in L, I'm like, yo. They was grooming him all this time. So after that becomes six, uh, six degrees of separation. And we can get into that a little bit. You know, Will plays a gay guy. But you got to look at how Will uh, prepared for the movie. So he, he admits to watching a lot of gay people, to learn how to kiss a man, to learn 
feminine attributes, right? Um, so I, I find that bizarre. Um, they flew him out to Europe to watch live shows, right? And I'm like, yo, this, like, I don't, I'm from Philly, so I'm just like, yeah. this is the, like, he's going in. He's, in his mind, he has to know how a gay man interacts with people, talking, mannerisms, getting ready for a love scene with another man. I'm like, why are you like in my mind? I'm like, why are you doing this? Like, why you, you have a successful TV show? Why go to playing a gay man? And why go to the extremes? Because anybody know Will, 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 when he puts his mind to something, every character, he goes in solid. You watching gay you're you you're going to lot show that means he had to get aroused by what yeah, that's what yeah and i and and we end up finding that that became i believe that became his addiction to men that was the addiction to men because he was in a safe environment right and they made that environment safe for him so whoever he was he could now become and that created a monster all right mark what do you got uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, we've got this steepling going on. Sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's here, but also what we're getting is a, a self soothing in the, 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 uh, the median nerve here, uh, which is connected right up your arm. Sometimes if you've got a, got a headache, if you kind of press into there, you can fix your headache. It's a quite an important nerve. So it's interesting that we're getting this self-soothing from him, rep repetitious finger movement in this area. That means there must be some big stress going on up here. I mean, maybe it's shoulder stress, maybe it's elbow stress, I mean, maybe it's stress in his hand, but it could be a bit of a headache for him to put this story Across, I mean, there, there could be all kinds of reasons. Maybe it's a really difficult, but maybe it's a very difficult true story for him to tell, or maybe it's a very difficult false story for him to tell. Um, some some vocal clicks in there as well. That's interesting. We'll we'll hear some further down the line as well. That for me often means stress. Look, might be stressful for him to be on a podcast, but then again, I mean, this is a guy who was. Uh, you, you know, like the assistant to some big Hollywood stars, you know, running around. He knows Hollywood really well. He knows entertainment. He hangs out with the stars. So I'm not sure what the big stress would be for him uh, sitting around a few bottles of wine upside down to say, well, we, we've sorted that one out. Let's have another. And I don't know what the what the stress would be about there. I mean, other than he's throwing his friend, his best friend, his best friend, under the bus. That's extraordinary. Uh, I got some of my best friends here. Uh, don't do that to me. <laughs> I mean, if you unless you really have to. I mean, unless you've got a book to sell. I mean, that might be that might be. <laughs> I mean, but otherwise, like I won't. I really wouldn't like that. I, that wouldn't. That would suggest to me you're not a best friend, uh, really. Um, so the narrative here that comes across is Hollywood groomed a gay man monster. Essentially, Hollywood groomed. So he, so he wasn't gay before, uh, but he got into doing six degrees of separation. That groomed him. Hollywood groomed him into being an absolute uh, homosexual monster. So Chase, to your point, that is utterly sensational. That is that is from the Blue Lagoon. That is that's 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 the thing. Um, so so classic Hollywood. Then for this Hollywood insider, I'll leave it on this. This Hollywood insider can't work out why Will Smith would want to do the lead role in Six Degrees of Separation. Just can't understand it. Why would Will Smith want to play this this role of a homosexual male in Six Degrees? Well, I'll tell you why. Because mm. it was the biggest show on Broadway. It was the biggest show. It won so many Tonys. It won a whole bunch of awards when it was in London. They then decided to make a film of it. Stockard Channing was going to do it. Stockard Channing was was set up for an Oscar on that. She didn't win the Oscar, but she was nominated. He was hoping he would be nominated and win an Oscar for it. That's why he does it. Does it for every reason that anybody does anything in Hollywood. They, they, at that high, high level, they're hoping to win one of those prizes. Why not? 
you like if you if you were offering me one i'd take it i wouldn't send it back that'd be fantastic but i don't not quite i don't quite understand why this hollywood insider has zero an idea why he would have taken that role because it was a great role he could have won an oscar he didn't that year but he could have chase what do you got on this one i'll tell you exactly why because he's from philly and he tells you over and over and over. And it seems to be some kind of code that he uses to remind people that he's tough and that he doesn't participate in these scenarios. And I think this is obvious to anybody, but it's a personal and precision attack on Will Smith's character. As for motive, there's not much I know about when it comes to this issue in this case and these people. Uh, and I personally find this kind of gossip type stuff disgusting to watch. And I'm repulsed uh, just kind of going through some of these videos, to be very frank with you. The campaign is crafted pretty well, though. In this video, he's making all the character assassination while at the same time, and I think he does this unconsciously, using justification, rationalization, blame shedding and projection to make it look like there's no obvious attack on will which he does a great job here in this video the eyebrow flashes up are all at these sensational moments and the other nonverbal behavior that you're going to see in this clip is around sensationalism with the deep-seated fear that he's going to accidentally be associated with some of the behavior here if you know what i'm talking about so he's desperately trying to distance himself from the homosexuality saying where he's from dictates what kind of person he is and keep in mind the stakes are extremely important when it comes to indicators of deception being present the lower the stakes are for the person talking the less likely you are to see deception markers so stakes are very important to raise when you're questioning somebody and just as a PSA, some of the videos coming up are about celebrity gossip. And just to let you know, I will not participate in that. It's a conscious choice of mine. No one, no one here has asked me to do that. But I want to set an example, I think, for more people than just my kids. And I think the gossip stuff is a little bit socially corrosive and has a tendency to make shame and judgment become a hobby for some people. So if you understand, I thank you for that. Scott, what do you got? You don't get it, Chase. You're not. <laughs> Good Lord. I know. And some of this stuff is so gossipy, man. It's just so, it's so gross. But anyway, so I'll build on what, what you were talking about. The more, uh, on whatever she replies to, he starts building on top of that. She'll say, so this happened? He'll go, yeah. And this and this and this. No matter what she says, he never says, no, 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 no. That, what happened was this. He doesn't correct her. He says, yeah, that's what happened. This is, she goes, this is the worst thing ever. It's worse than that, man. Here it's, and it makes it bigger and bigger and bigger. This is the first time we, we actually hear him getting in detail about the grooming of Will. So his illustrators are slowly becoming larger and larger and more uh, prevalent. And the swallowing between words, that sort of got my attention there because that lets us know he's a little bit nervous as he's coming on with confidence. So he's beginning to look more confident at, at this point. And his, his, his enlarging illustrators and his voice tone, that says, for me, I'm selling something. Because he's he, when she asks questions, quite often, a couple of times he explodes out into it. But he starts off slow. And we watch it ramp up to this excitement he's got going on. But he waits till she's locked in as he starts doing that. Because she's she's doing a great job. It's because she's just listening. The more he talks, the more she just sits there and listens. And that's what you want in in from our perspective in an interview, you want somebody just talking, just let him go and go and go. And the more he goes, for me personally, the worse this thing sounded to him. So he starts down this path about how it sounds to me like he's heard all this before through gossip. Not that he, he I'm sure some of the things like with that kiss he was talking about earlier, maybe he saw that, probably saw that. But a lot of this stuff, when it comes to the gossip part, uh, going back to what you were talking about, Chase, I'm with you, man. A lot of this stuff just sounds like gossip that he's he's blowing up and saying i can take that and i'll take this because everybody knows about that it's it's so it's, it's almost ridiculous but i also noticed uh he's agreeing with and not only is he agreeing with and building on what she's saying i think he might be creating a couple things outside of that as well that's i could be wrong about that but as it gets bigger and bigger i think he's adding to that stuff that he that he hadn't thought about before if that makes any sense so 
let's also pay attention to how he, how the times that he backs up. It's not a big deal. It's not a whole lot. He doesn't back up like that. But as he's talking, he gets up and he backs up just a little bit. That's one of the key things you look for. When I'm training entrepreneurs how to pitch, and they're going into a venture capitalist or an angel investor or, or just investors who they're talking to, I make sure when they get asked a question about financials, they don't move back even the least bit because if there's somebody like me in there watching them, then I'm going to say, you know what? They're not really confident with what they're with their answer, what they're talking about. Not they're lying, not they're not telling the truth, but they may, even though they're the financial person, they may not be the one that came up with that answer to your question. It's something they read and they're they're prepped for, but they may not know it in depth. And it's important to know if the financial person you're talking about or talking to, asking questions to about knows what they're talking about. They have to know the backstory. Where are the financials really going? So that's one of the key things you look for is when they back up a little bit. Doesn't mean they're being deceptive every time or they're not even being deceptive. They're just not confident with what's happening there. Um, quite often you, you hear that phrase, where there's smoke, there's fire. I smell smoke. This is starting to smell like something's up here because he's too into it. He's, And I agree with you again, Chase. I've got a, as we go through these, there's a couple other parts where it looks like there's something going on where he's, I don't know what the problem is, but he's mad about something. If indeed he is angry, which I'm, I think he's been over the anger part for so long. He just started, uh, I'll agree with there as well, what sounds like a smear campaign. Because so far, he's not corrected anything that she's asked or said. Granted, she's just repeating a lot of what he's saying. But at some point, you can say, well, it's not that bad. It's, it's more like this. Nope. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Greg, what do you got? So let's talk about a few things. One, Chase, I agree with you. There's a whole lot of gossip in here. What I hope to do through this is where the gossip is to pin it down and say, that's gossip. Here's how you know. Because the holidays are on us, and you're going to get a chance to talk to a lot of people in the next few weeks. And you should be able to identify gossip versus truth. I think it's a great opportunity for that. The second one is you're going to run into exactly what this guy's doing right here. This is conspiracy theory thinking, exactly what he's doing. He's got no real facts. He's got secondhand information, but he's he's shopping it as fact. And if you don't believe that, pay attention to him. What I love is Tasha's face is so expressive. She's like, what? I love that whole furrowed brow and all those things. When he does that down, and, and Chase, you're going to hear him try to separate self from Will Smith with that Philly thing over and over and over. I agree. And he does throw Will Smith under the bus where he say he, he almost comes out and says, I believe he was always gay. He just got the chance to be who he was. I mean, he's trying to throw him under the bus at some case here, even if he's masking it. But when I say he's doing conspiracy theory, what conspiracy theory people will do is they'll fish and farm information to you to see how much you're willing to take. And, you know, I've used this term before on the show. I don't know how many years it's been. But in the Army, there's something we call aiming stakes. And it means that when I'm in the dark, Chase, you never had to deal with this because when you're in a dirt and you got guys on each side of you, you put stakes in the ground so you don't shoot in their area. This guy is taking the extreme, the most extreme thing he thinks of and watch him raise his brow and ask for approval when he says they sent him to live sex shows. See that? Watch that face up and he's waiting for an answer and then his face drops. That's his outside stake. He does another outside stake and then he goes and he's got believability because there's this picture of Will Smith kissing this kissing uh, another actor. So then he's like, OK, now he's built on something where Will Smith kissed another actor in Hollywood. Now he's going to this. This is the basics of running a conspiracy theory. Now, look, here's the other thing. All conspiracy theories are not false. Sometimes they're true. We don't know. But they're not firsthand knowledge. You always see these guys who are saying, and then they had UFOs, and then there were aliens, and they're fishing for what you'll believe, and then they abducted me. And when they get to that point, then you have to start paying attention for where they're looking for that. Other comments are easier for him you know, than this one comment, so he's just rolling those off, but watch for where he's hit his hardest one. And then he comes back, and we'll start watching from here. He does request for approval. He raises his forehead at every building block of his story. Doesn't mean it's not true. It simply means that he's getting your approval before he moves to the next state. And when you're talking to a person at a party and they are telling you a conspiracy theory, pay attention to those because you'll see the elements that matter as their brow rises and they're asking for approval. And you'll see that aiming state when they go really to the far and they're holding their head up like, you believe that one too? That's their far reach. Pay attention, and I'll give you some tools later for how to back that down. One of those tape replays. 
two private investigator firms. Right? Okay. To to find out a lot of the allegations that were made be, uh, uh, towards people in Will's circle. Okay. Right. And um, as we get into the interview, I'll start to give you, you know, real you examples. Okay. Right? okay. Of 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 how that goes. Um, but seeing that, I, I said, "Wow!" And I just didn't know how to take it coming from Philly and seeing something like that. But with my knowledge of now over having 30 years in the business, it's like, okay, this is the grooming. This is how the grooming starts. I didn't know that back then. But now, you know, having to spend decades in L, I'm like, yo, they was grooming him all this time. So after that becomes six, uh, six degrees of separation. And we can get into that a little bit. You know, Will plays a gay guy, but you got to look at how Will uh, prepared for the movie. So he he admits to watching a lot of gay to learn how to kiss a man, to learn feminine attributes. Right. Um, so I, I find that bizarre. Um, they flew him out to Europe to watch live shows. Right. And I'm like, yo, this like. I don't, I'm from Philly, so I'm just like, yeah. this is the, like, he's going in. He's, in his mind, he has to know how a gay man interacts with people, talking, mannerisms, getting ready for a love scene with another man. I'm like, why are you, like, in my mind, I'm like, why are you doing this? Like, why, you, you have a successful TV show. Why go to playing a gay man? And why go to the extremes? Because anybody know Will, 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 when he puts his mind to something, every character, he goes in solid. You watching gay, p- you're, you're, you're going to lot shows. That means he had to get aroused by yeah, watching Yeah, that's what, it, yeah. And I, and, and we end up finding that that became, I believe that became his addiction to men. That was the addiction to men because he was in a safe environment, Right. And they made that environment safe for him. So whoever he was, he could now become. And that created a monster. So let's, how did you get to Will Smith and Dwayne so, Martin? So let me tell you. So um, Will did an episode of the show called All of Us, where he ironically plays Lisa Ray's love interest. Okay. Um, and he, you know, he starred on the show a few times. So, of course, he's there and I have to take care of, of him. So meaning that production knows when Will come, everything should go through me, whether they need, and he's wearing two hats. He's acting on his show and he's executive producer. So um, we have a lunch break and normally lunch break is never interrupted. But by Will wearing a producer hat, um, they say, hey, B, we need to get Will to break lunch for 15 minutes to come look at the next shot. He's a producer in the shot, not the actor. So I'm like, OK, we already know. And if you don't know, Hollywood is the hurry up and, and, and wait game. So three minutes later after them telling me, hey, you got eyes on Will. You got we, we, we need him to come watch this. So I'm running all over the, the, the studio. He's not in his dressing room. I go to the cafeteria. I'm like, well, but I see his car there. I'm like, where is this guy at? So now I'm holding Dwayne down, too. So I have the keys to his dressing room. So I'm like, yo. And they're calling my my they I'm on walkie talkie and they're calling my cell phone. Yo, we need to get Will here. And I'm like, yo, kind of down. Like I'm trying to find is like this is this is unlike him, right? So all right, I open the um, door to Dwayne's dressing room, and that's when I see Dwayne and having sex with Will. Let me process that for a second. Who was on top? It wasn't a top. There was a couch and um, Will was bent over on the couch and Dwayne was standing up, killing him. Murder. Like, murder. It was murder in there. Okay, Chase, what do you got? This is classic sensationalist speech here. And I'm just going to give you the exact formula that he's following because it's been followed since the 1920s in a lot of these speeches. And I think he does this on accident. I don't think he has a team that built this up. He's not got like some Edward Bernays PR uh, expert there. Here's the exact formula. He builds his own authority. 
He sets the scene for the listener. He builds his authority and status again. Then he demonstrates how good of a person he is. Then he builds up to the climax of the scene. Then right at that climax, he uses very strong language and metaphors to vividly paint a picture in the listener's mind. That's a recipe to make sensationalist content. That's what you would see in like the National Enquirer. So then the host here pretends to need to process it for a second. There's no emotion in the host. There's no real reaction whatsoever on her face. And then she asks the most irrelevant, sensationalist, predictable answer you'd hear in someone who's participating in a smear campaign. Who was on top? So, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, and while all that is true, yes, that's how you get to sensationalist stories. You also do some of those same things when you're telling the truth. So if I'm going to give you a frame of reference for why I saw this and why I know, what I love about this video is I, my little summary says he starts with a great baseline and residual emotion, and that dries up at the key time. That's damning. So what happens is he's got great illustrating as he's telling his role on the set. His brow comes up at, do you get it? And then his brow drops off as soon as you reward him. He does a request for approval again. When he talks about Will's two hats, we're back to him telling you the elements of his story that matter. As soon as she approves, he keeps moving. And then he says, you see it again when he says he's wearing his producer hat. This is his baseline. Lots of movement, lots of approval as he's telling you the stories. And he's still eye accessing to where he started in that very first thing off to his right. So probably that's where his memory is somewhere over there. It could be wrote because he's told it so many times. And then he's even when he's doing this Hollywood, his hurry up and wait, his baseline is punctuating with his hands and his brow. That's all good. Then there's also residual emotion when he's talking about not being able to find him. There's all the stress. You see his face. You see all the stress. When he says holding him down, he means he's his support team on the on the team. Don't infer anything by that. Then he gets to the real thing right before he right before he gets to open the door. Look at his illustration for walkie talkie and cell phone. Everything is beautiful. He opens the door and there's no shock in his face. No residuals. Nothing. Nothing, nothing. The hands suddenly close down from extended fingers. Now his brow goes up. If this is what he came here to say, you would think this would be the most comfortable thing and the most powerful and demonstrative thing he would say. This is arguably the single most important thing he's going to say in this whole interview. This does not look believable because all of this stuff comes apart and his hands close and he gets quiet and goes down, puts his hands together. There's just so much in this. However, while Chase, I agree with you, she doesn't show a lot of emotion in the beginning. At the very end here, look at that grief muscle as she's contemplating what she just heard. It's like she just discovered there's no Santa Claus. Scott, what do you got? All right. This is the first time that he's given out information that's dangerous. He's bringing in somebody else that's famous or that's powerful in, in their business world. And he's telling some, some pretty graphic stuff here i mean this is this is this is there's a lot going on supposedly and he he starts telling this mind-bending story about Dwayne martin and will it's detailed but when he talks about the going in the dressing room would you not knock before you went in even though you had a key that's one thing you're going to do you're going to go in and you're going to if you have the key to the place you're going to go in and you'll knock before you go in that right there says to me, I, I don't know, man, that that started shutting it down for me once I started listening to this. Um, as it goes along, his again, he's ramping up. He gets more excited. His, his illustrators increase. He gets up a little bit bigger. Um, everything seems to get larger. Even the story he's telling seems to expand as he goes along. And another thing that, that caught my attention were his head movements. He's doing a lot of looking around, going back and forth. He hasn't really done that. He's, he has some up at this point, but this is getting even heavier. This lets us know there's there's some stress there, some nerves um, stuff going on at this point. And I think it's so much it's out of his baseline from what we've seen up to now. So after he gives that uh, description, he looks back at his, he goes back to his hands and that barrier thing and his, his fingers close. So I think his confidence is sort of, of going away with that part as well. Not that he's going, oh no, I shouldn't have told that. But when you start telling the story and it's getting a little bit out of hand, there's got to be that inner dialogue going on. You go, ooh, I better tamp this down a little bit because it's getting it's getting a little bit out of hand. 
I, I don't think that's even happening. He, it sounds to me like a little child telling a story to his friends about Indians in the basement or, you know, I found this was given to me by a ninja, those those types of stories, because it seems so out of reality. Like I was talking about earlier, it's like a UFO or a Bigfoot story. Something's just not right here. So, Mark, what do you got? Well, it is fantastical, but, you know, Hollywood, everything, everything is 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 possible. Um, there are some facts there. Uh, Will did a show. And, and we see him bat on, which is, you know, that gesture that people make. Sometimes they'll bat on with their hands. Sometimes they'll bat on with their shoulders. They, they might do it with their, their nose, but he's conducting along to the rhythm of his speech. And Will did a show and we go, OK, yeah, well, that's true. Will did do a show. So, OK, we've got a good baseline there for the truth. And remember that because we'll come back to those batons in a few videos time. But you're right. Everything's been building to this, this, you know, this part of the story, which is, for want of a better idea, the money. This is the money. This is the thing that he's really selling. This is the moment. And there's lots of detail up until the moment of opening that door. And then yet, I, I agree, everything closes down from then on when it should open up. When it should be the moment of 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 you like you don't have to sell this stuff. This this stuff sells itself. So why does he want to close down on that? We even get some self soothing there as well. Watch out for that self soothing rep repetitive gesture there to make him more comfortable. Why does he need to be comfortable about this? He's selling out his friend clearly. Like he needs to go all out. At this moment, not closed down, we get an upward inflection with the voice at the end of the line. Like, no, I mean, if this happened, just tell me. It's just an instruction. It is, I wasn't there. So you tell me what happened. You don't, I, I can't answer your questions on this. So why the upward inflection on this? It's not cultural for him. It's, 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 we haven't heard it before. Why does he need that upward inflection at the end of this line? And Chase, I absolutely agree. We have the, imagery that he puts with the sexual act there um uh you know killing murder well why use those metaphors uh, maybe that's cultural to him but it's an interesting choice to go with imagery which is criminal alongside this act doesn't really describe the act, doesn't describe what's going. There's no like, and my head turned and I had to look down the, the, the van or the, or the, you know, I needed to, it's just like he steps in and like, it's there right in front of him. Like there must have been more corners to turn. There must have been, I, I moved my head. There must have been more that happened there. There must have been certain things being obscured by, but no, none of that. He's right in there in the crime, the murder, the killing. It's, it's um, you know, it's it's textbook Hollywood horror. Hollywood horror. Fantastic. Love it. One of those tape replays. So let's, how did you get to Will Smith and Dwayne so, Martin? So let me tell you. So um, Will did an episode of the show called All of Us, where he ironically plays Lisa Ray's love interest. Okay. Um, and he, you know, he starred on the show a few times. So, of course, he's there and I have to take care of, of him. So, meaning that production knows when we'll come, everything should go through me, whether they, and he's wearing two hats. He's acting on his show and he's executive producer. So, um, we have a lunch break and normally lunch break is never interrupted, but by Will wearing a producer hat, um, they say, hey, B, we need to get Will to break lunch for 15 minutes to come look at the next shot. He's a producer in the shot, not the actor. So I'm like, OK, we already know. And if you don't know, Hollywood is the hurry up and, and, and wait game. So three minutes later after them telling me, hey, you got eyes on Will. You got we we, we need him to come watch this. So I'm running all over the, the, the studio. He's not in his dressing room. I go to the cafeteria. I'm like, well, but I see his car there. I'm like, where's this guy at? So now I'm holding Dwayne down too. So I have the keys to his dressing room. So I'm like, yo, and they're calling my, my they, I'm on walkie talkie and they're calling my cell phone. Yo, we need to get Will here. And I'm like, yo, kind of down. Like I'm trying to find is like, this is, this is unlike him. Right. So all right, I open the um, door to Dwayne's dressing room. And that's when I see Dwayne and having sex with Will. Let me process that for a second. Who was on top? 
It wasn't a top. There was a couch and um, Will was bent over on the couch and Dwayne was standing up, killing him. Murder, like murder. It was murder in there. Okay. What did you do? I, I, I froze. What you, I, see, I'm not used to seeing. Listen, it, it's traumatizing. Like, to, like, I've never seen it. I don't watch. You know, I never seen a, a man, another man. Oh, Will Smith was bent over. And, and Dwayne was killing him. Condom? I don't know. I, I don't. You didn't look that close. Not, listen, I'm even when I was with the deer and hair lights and I finally said, oh, shit. And they turned around, said, close the door. Right. So I back out the door. I'm not going in there. No, I ain't going up in there. I back out the door, lock the door. I leave. Right. So um, now I'm off a of walkie talkie, everything. So it's chaos on the set. Nobody can get in touch with Will. Nobody can get in touch with me. So I said, all right, I got I got to leave. Then I said, do I leave or do I stay? So I said, you know what? I'm going to stay. But my position is I didn't see anything. Right. So um, Will says, I got to talk to you. So I said, about what? He said, you know what? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, oh, you know what I'm talking about. I said, well, I have no idea. What are you talking about? What, what we need to finish today? Like, I'm trying to get that out. So he said, no, we need to talk. So he said, listen, um, I made a call. Some papers are going to come here today. I need you to sign them. And I said, I, why am I signing papers? And he said, listen, I'm trying to protect you. So... He says three things that make me scared because I fear no man but a law, but uh, I don't fear nothing but a law. And he said that you remember the uh, the transsexual, I hope I'm saying it right, who got caught with Eddie Murphy. He said, you know what happened to him, right? I had no idea what happened to the transsexual that got caught in the car with Eddie me Murphy. Me either. What happened? So I go home and Google it. They murdered him. Or, or the transsexual. I don't know to say him or her. I don't know what's politically correct. So I hope I'm not offending anyone. It's transgender. but Okay, it's transgender. Trans woman. So, okay. So they said, now you can Google this yourself. This okay. is one of the things he said. They said that the transgender that was caught uh, uh, in the car with Eddie Murphy, where Anthony Murphy paid this guy to have, or the transgender to have, was about to start doing interviews. And back then, they paid, you know, the internet wasn't big. They paid you gobs of money to do interviews. Mm -hmm. And they said that the transgender person locked herself out the house, tied some sheets together from a roof, and tried to swing into the apartment from the roof. This is documented. Do you know anybody that get locked out the house that's going to tie some sheets together and swing into the to their apartment from the roof? Mm -mm. Okay. All right. You just break a window. So okay. Yeah. Okay. So now I want people to Google that. So this is what he told me. And I go home and I'm on AOL. Plug in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not high speed internet at yeah. this time. And I was like, oh, they murdered this person. Right? Then he told me that he made a song called... Um, uh, you saw my blinker, but Will's claim to fame in rap is he never cursed on records, right? We'd mm -hmm. agree, right? And that song, he calls the woman a bitch several times. I swear left and I swear right, but she was still tailgating me too damn tight. To the left lane, I tried to switch then. You saw my blinker. So I believe it's like, you saw my blinker. And then now I tell people to go Google that, too. And he's talking about slapping the lady. Ever. I mean, he's talking crazy. So he said, um, the powers that be got me to do that song. And he said, um, they said it will never make a light of day. And well, they'll always protect me, even though I say I don't cuss in records. So I go home. I Google that. I do the search engine on that. It comes back. Will cussing on records. I said, this, this is crazy. Why haven't nobody ever called him out saying he never cussed on records? And he's obviously ca calling women and talking about he going to slap somebody on this record. Then he said um, he referenced the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the first Aunt Viv, of how he got rid of her on the show. 
right? And, uh, and she'll never work again. And he said, I don't want this for you. And I said, yo, I never went back. All right, Greg, what do you got? So now when they're talking about what he did, he goes back to his baseline. And this feels like he's describing an actual act. It's back to the body language of that conspiracy theory on video two, however. His cadence shifts, and right after he says, I back out of the door and leave, his cadence changes. Then he goes back into more elements of this whole, you know, I'm going to give you details that are, can't be proven. I'm going to tell you things that I've heard that are secondhand. This reminds me of every conspiracy theory, every urban myth I've ever heard in my life. So I, how do I feel about it? I feel like I'm seeing a guy who lives in that space where he doesn't have to nail down facts, where he's going to use hearsay, where he can use gossip and be able to validate that because of his presence. Look, if you are a person, not saying this is the case with him, but it's quite possible. If you're a person who has a single thing, the biggest feather in your hat, the biggest thing to tie yourself to is Will Smith. And Will Smith starts to cascade out of control and go down the drain, you better ride that pony while you can. And that, I would not be surprised to see us find a lot more people come out of the woodwork and start doing things. I'm also going to tell you conspiracy theories can be true. All you have to do is watch the news every day in the U.S. and conspiracy theories are turning out to be true all over the place. But you should not repeat them without known facts because somebody told you. Now we're getting the chases problem with Hollywood gossip but it doesn't have to be in Hollywood. This can be the cul-de-sac too. There can be cul-de-sac gossip going on about you or you. And the way you have to circumvent that is by asking hard questions. Hey, who told you that? How'd they know? And when did they hear it? Those are three questions we always ask in interrogation. If I'm interrogating Mark and he says, hey, there's nuclear weapons over here. Well, how do you know? Well, Chase told me. Well, how the hell does Chase know? Oh, he worked there. Okay, when did he work there? If you just ask those few handful of questions, they're not intrusive and jerky. You're saying, hey, where did you hear that? It shuts down a lot of gossip. It shuts down a lot of that repetition of things. And we'll actually get to the root of it once you start tracking it back. And sometimes you'll find it's just somebody lying for a sport, as I would say. Uh, Chase, what do you got? This is uh, a lot more celebrity kind of BS stuff. So I'm not really going to comment on it. But I will just say this. Uh, to Greg, your point, you talked about conspiracy theories. I'll give you one trick that people use when they make conspiracy theories that makes you feel superior by listening. And here's a perfect example of an easy way to understand it. Imagine you hear the news, somebody on the news say, a uh, local woman was reported missing earlier. Witnesses say they witnessed her and her boyfriend in an argument. More on that at 6.30. So what they did was make you, they didn't tie those things together for you. The trick that they did, yes, they did get you to tie those things together, but the true trick in that is making you get a placebo of feeling clever for putting those two things together. So it's maybe call it a clever placebo. So they're giving you a two pieces of data and letting you start tying those together by yourself, which also makes you feel clever, which makes you more bought in to the idea because it made you feel good to come up with it. Scott, what do you got? All right. Again, his baseline changes a little bit more and his, his illustrators here get huge. He gets loud and his ramp up to this thing is odd as well. So this, again, this sounds like a Bigfoot story or ghost story, UFO story. This is what it looks like to me, where the little child says, here's what happened, and they start telling you what happened. His, his excitement increases as he tells what happened. There's no matter of fact, no, no delivery like, here, here's what happened. Nothing like that at all. It's like ghost story delivery. At the very end, that's when the ghost shows up. And, you, you know... It's, you know, he's missing an arm or, you know, the guys, that, the phone call is coming from in, inside the house, whatever it is. That's where all the action happens in those stories. And that's what's happening here is the ramp up to it. Now, quite often when you have a story and you're pretty excited about it, it you almost explode with it right out of the gate. You don't come on with, here's what happened. I'm sitting in the, over here and this happens. And then all of a sudden, then bang, and then it blows up. For example, and Greg, you'll, I think you'll remember this one time. I was going to talk to this guy. I was going to interview him about uh, some things he shouldn't have done. And he was an IT guy. And he had, he was 
uh, they were trying to find out whether or not he was the guy that was stealing all this information from him and sell it to somebody else. So I called Greg on my way and I said, hey, he's like, what's going on? I said, like, well, I'm sitting there, I got 20 minutes before I go in. We sat there and talked for a little while and I explained to him what the thing was. When I got finished, I came outside because what happened was this. When I started talking to the guy, I didn't even lean into him hard. I was with him for maybe 45 minutes and he starts crying. Remember that, Greg? I uh, even showed you a picture. <laughs> of this guy starts crying and, it's, and then he just started puking everything. He's just telling me everything. 45 minutes in, tell me stuff I didn't even ask. Things, and he'd been doing this for other to other companies for years. He'd been doing, told me everything. So when I get back on the phone, I call Greg. I'm like, dude, you're not going to believe it. And just started, wow, you know, here's what happened. It wasn't like, well, I went and talked to him, sat for a little while. And the next thing you know, he starts talking about, and then, and it doesn't ramp up like that. You get right to the point. And that's what this guy is missing. He's got that ramp up going at the end where the ghost is, at the ghost story. We've all heard, heard those that, that when, when you're a little kid, that, that, you know, you're camping out or you're sleeping over somebody's house and somebody's got their ghost story and they tell you what happened. And, and then you come up with a big kaboom there at the end. This guy, I think, I'm going to go ahead and say, I think he's telling the story. I think he's making this up because this isn't, this isn't flowing the way it should flow. If he's mad, that's one thing. I, th I, I think he's mad, but he's not showing any anger as he does it. That's why it's that conniving, uh, in my opinion, that's that, that conniving thing where you're just smearing him oh, you, and you're being cool about it. Here's what happened, man. They're, because who knows outside of those people, the way he set it up. Um, I'm going to go back to that the door, knocking on the door. There's a hierarchy that goes on when you have an assistant. Now, when you're in a dressing room, let's say we're at, at uh, let's say we're doing Dr. Phil. Did anybody come in that room in, in, in your, our dressing rooms when without knocking? No, they knocked and they waited for us to say they weren't knocking and open the door. What's going on? They knocked. Then we said, who is it or come in or whatever. And then they would come in. No, tell them what's going to be going. We could be standing there in our underwear. We could be, you know, naked, whatever's going to happen. But they always ask about that. And assistants, they that guy worked for Will, so he's not going to jump that hierarchy and and be above him. And this guy Dwayne and just unlock the door and go in, especially if it's locked. He may have tried the handle. If he did, he would have knocked. He wouldn't just walk up and then open the door and go ah and go in like that. That doesn't sound right. When you're in a situation where somebody's telling you a story like this and you get a feeling something's not right, listen to the reality of how things play out from scene to scene that they're creating. Think about what's happening. He says, I walked in. Well, did he just walk in like that? Why wouldn't he have knocked? You got to think of the little things like that. The reality of the chain of events that happens have to be in play there. They have to lay out perfectly or at least close. And nothing here is close in this from my point of view. That's the way I view things. Mark, what do you think? What do you got? Yeah, just a couple of things. He says, I leave, and there's a, vo a vocal click again. I, I don't I mean if you just left, that would be that would be just factual. I left. I leave. You don't need any stress around that. If anything, like the stress should be down now because you're leaving what was a, a crime, uh, according to his metaphors. It's you know, it would be it would be de-stressing, but he's he leaves and there's that click of stress going on there. Then uh, we need to talk, says Will, apparently, and there's some discussion or, or point that, that lawyers will come and there's an NDA is going to be signed. But again, the barriers come in and he closes it down. And if this is factual, that's the stuff that should open up because this is this would be factual information that, that would clarify the story. Uh, you know, no conspiracy would be needed because it would be factual. Now, like everybody else, I'm not saying that conspiracies don't exist. Just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean that everybody isn't out to get you. Everybody may be out to get you. But is it probable that everybody is out to get you? No, it's more probable that some, but not all people, might be on some days out to get you, but this is extravagant. Uh, you know, where it's going to go next is into an extravagant Hollywood level story of, of conspiracy and more, more murder. Let's see how we enjoy that. Wow.
one of those tape replays. Okay. What did you do? I, I, I froze. What did you, <laughs> see, I'm not used to seeing. Listen, it, it's traumatizing. Like, to, like, I've never seen it. I don't watch. You know, I never seen a, a man, another man. Oh, Will Smith was bent over. And, and Dwayne was killing him. Condom? I don't know. I, I don't. You didn't look that close. Not, listen, I'm even when I was with the Darren headlights and I finally said, oh, shit. And they turned around, said, close the door. Right. So I back out the door. I'm not going in there. No, I ain't going up in there. I back out the door, lock the door. I leave. Right. So um, now I'm off a of walkie talkie, everything. So it's chaos on the set. Nobody can get in touch with Will. Nobody can get in touch with me. So I said, all right, I got I to gotta leave. Then I said, do I leave or do I stay? So I said, you know what? I'm going to stay. But my position is I didn't see anything. Right. So um, Will says, I got to talk to you. So I said, about what? He said, you know what? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, oh, you know what I'm talking. I said, well, I have no idea what are you talking about? What, what we need to finish today? Like, I'm trying to get that out. So he said, no, we need to talk. So he said, listen, um, I made a call. Some papers are going to come here today. I need you to sign them. And I said, I, why am I signing papers? And he said, listen, I'm trying to protect you. So he says three things that make me scared because I fear no man but Allah. But uh, I don't fear nothing but Allah. And he said that you remember the uh, the transsexual, I hope I'm saying it right, who got caught with Eddie Murphy. He said, you know what happened to him, right? I had no idea what happened to the transsexual that got caught in the car with Eddie Murphy. Me either. What happened? So I go home and Google it. They murdered him. Or, or the transsexual. I don't know to say him or her. I don't know what's politically correct. So I hope I'm not offending anyone. It's transgender. but Okay, no. transgender. Trans woman. So, okay. So they said, now you can Google this yourself. This okay. is one of the things he said. They said that the transgender that was caught uh, uh, in the car with Eddie Murphy, where Eddie Murphy paid this guy to have, or the transgender to have, was about to start doing interviews. And back then, they paid, you know, the internet wasn't big. They paid you gobs of money to do interviews. Mm -hmm. And they said that the transgender person locked itself out the house, tied some sheets together from a roof, and tried to swing into the apartment from the roof. This is documented. Do you know anybody that get locked out the house that's going to tie some sheets together and swing into the to their apartment from the roof? Mm -mm. OK. All right. You just break a window. OK. Yeah. OK. So now I want people to Google that. So this is what he told me. And I go home and I'm on AOL plug in mm -hmm. <laughs> Not high speed Internet. At yeah. this time. And I was like, oh, they murdered this person. Right. Then he told me that he made a song called um, uh, You Saw My Blinker. But Will's claim to fame in rap is he never cursed on records. Right? We'd mm -hmm. agree, right? And that song, he calls the woman a bitch several times. I swear left and I swear right, but she was still tailgating me too damn tight. To the left lane, I tried to switch then. You saw my blinker. So I believe it's like, you saw my blinker. And then now I tell people to go Google that, too. And he's talking about slapping the lady ever. I mean, he's talking crazy. So he said, um, the powers that be got me to do that song. And he said, um, they said it will never make a light of day. And will they'll always protect me, even though I say I don't cuss in records. So I go home. I Google that. I do the search engine on that. It comes back. Will cussing on records. I said, this, this is crazy. Why haven't nobody ever called him out saying he never cussed on records? And he's obviously ca calling women and talking about he going to slap somebody on his record. Then he said um, he referenced the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the first Aunt Viv, of how he got rid of her on the show. Right. And uh, and she'll never work again. And he said, I don't want this for you. And I said, yo, I never went back. That Will has because she has all these things on Will 
that he has to be a puppet. Like what? Like is it the homosexual? I mean, no. Well, I've, well, we already dispelled that. Did y'all? Did you and Will ever have closure conversation no, on well, that? No, since f- the- heck, heck, no. I'm not having no. Heck, no. There wasn't no closure. Did Dwayne Martin ever try to come to you and talk no, to you? I, I did, listen, because see, here's here's the thing. When you're dealing with a real cat, it's just like, I don't, listen, that's y'all thing. Like, I'm not gay bashing Will. I feel that Will should just come out, right? Because it's going to eventually come out. My problem is Will is hurting more people protecting his secrets, right? Because you're trying to hot all these things and you're building up just... You're hurting so many people to try to hide what you're doing. So, for example, okay. let's say like the new this is what Jada makes the new people do. And I ain't going to say no. They probably been there after myself. Mm-hmm. Right. It's they will make you check into a rehab and they'll pay for the rehab, even though you're not on drugs. They're going to pay for the rehab and you have to go if you want to work with them. Right. Or be in their circumference. Then. They're going to say, hey, we need you while these cameras rolling to go in there and and take some money out of our pocket. You know, we left some money in the coat pocket. Go in the room. The cameras is going. Go in there and take that money out. Do they know the cameras is going? Yeah, they're telling them because this is the setup that if they hire you or when they hire you, if you decide that you want to expose something. Oh, we they gonna discredit you. Oh, this person's a junkie. We love them, but we had to pay for their rehab. We got, you know, we got video of them stealing money out of our pocket. You know, they'll tell you, hey, give you your credit card, go shopping, go get yourself some, you know, some sneakers, a jacket, a hat, you know, high end. You know, what the- and, and yeah, and then Jada will report the credit card stolen, but they won't press charges. So if you ever try to give information on Will or Jada, they automatically discredit you. So now it's like, why do you think people don't speak up? Why are not people speaking up? They can get a bag. I know what I'm offered for book deals. I know what I'm being offered. Right. So it's it's the discredit game. If they clear to break their NDA. They're going to be say, oh, man, this person is a junkie. Then, you know, they're going to have some sexual acts on you. They, it's it's all kind of stuff they do. This is why people don't come forward. This is why people don't come forward. Why can't people just be real? I'll go first on this one. Uh, this is sort of an introduction for the uninitiated with how the criminal mind works and the things they think about that you would never think of to think about how they get things done or when they con people. There, there was a, a book that I found years and years and years ago, and it's called Games Criminals Play. I'll put a link up to it below. And it talks about the, the same things he's talking about, how he, he talks about, oh, they'd send you to rehab and you go through rehab. Then if you did anything wrong, they would use that against you. That's one of the things that's in this book they talk about. For example, they would some guy in prison would say to a guy, to a guard there, you know, hey, look, will you do me a huge favor, man? My wife needs, a, will you take her this $40 or whatever it is, or this book or something? Will you please do me that favor? And the guy, the the guard would take the um, book over to that, to the, to the, to his house, to his apartment or whatever. And when he gets there, she'd open the door and, and, and she said, I'll be right there, come in. So she didn't open the door, he comes in, shuts the door. Then she walks out in a towel, drops the towel and hugs him. And he's like, good Lord, you know, here's this, your husband said to give this book, I got to go and he'll leave. Then what he gets in the mail is a picture of him being hugged by this nude woman and a note that says, if you don't do this, and I'm sending this to your wife, which the guy in prison has completely set up. It's things like that. It's these little games they, they put together that take advantage of you. It's, it's what cons do as well. It's one of those. So, I'll, like I said before, it's called Games Criminals Play. I'll put a, I'll put a link in it below. Read that book; it'll open your mind up to a whole world you weren't aware of, or a whole way of thinking about things that you may not have been aware of. That that cons will do, and and criminals will do. Not necessarily just prisoners, but criminals in general. Um, here we're seeing chaff and redirect writ large because he he starts she starts asking him a question and then he moves on and has nothing to do he starts talking about gay bashing how he's not a gay basher has nothing to do with the question she just asked him he's he's scooting along just to get out the information he wants to and still make himself look like a hero like a good guy 
this the, the the this whole thing is is for me. I can't believe she didn't say what. Wait a minute. Let's go back and she's not a an, an interviewer like we are. She wouldn't know to to question that way or maybe to stop it. Gail would. Gail King would stop him. But it just it just sounds wrong. He's running from this at that point. His illustrators all but disappear for most of this video. And when he doesn't use illustrator, when he does use his illustrators, man, they're huge. Because he said, oh, here's my point. Boom. They go up and he starts making his point. Then he goes back down to normal because maybe he's getting into something he wasn't ready for. You know, or has no big, um, lavish, smearing answer for. Um, he's not really given any good information. He's just assuming for a lot of these things, the information he's given her. It sounds like he's heard this stuff. It sounds like gossip to me. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of gross. But he did a wonderful job of changing that information. To, to get around. She doesn't even notice that he's moved on to something else at that point. This is, and I'll say this, this is a professional, this is a pro bull. This guy is a pro. And that makes me think when he's talking to using these um, phrases he's using, he's talking about how they're setting him up and they'll make him go in a room and, and look like he's robbing something. It's stuff that's directly out of this book, and it's the kind of thing criminals talk about, which lets me know this guy's been hanging out in the wrong place, or I would assume that. I'm not sure. But he sure talks like he knows a lot about that world, and that's right. But he's he's talking about it like, like it's something new to him, but he's not selling the part well where it's new to him. I don't know if that makes any sense. But it doesn't look like it's new to him. It doesn't sound to me like it's new to him, although it's trying to make it look like, guess what happened? Not at all. It just sounds a little bit odd. And then he he he, he talks about um, Will coming out as if he's explaining why he's doing this. Like he's he just wants Will to come out and tell everybody what's happening because he's hurting other people. He keeps making himself sound like the hero here. He's the hero in, in his own story. We'll go back to Kafka. I always talk about that. But every man um, must be the, the hero of his own, own story. Mm-hmm. And that's what he's doing. He's being the hero of his own story. He's telling you what a great guy he is while he's slamming these this other guy. He's mad about something. It'll it'll I'm sure it'll show up at some point what he's mad about or what he's angry about. Because there's something there's a something in their backstory here that he's not covering in all this. Um, all right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll be pretty short on this. He is from Philly. He's already told you that, so you should know that he knows all about all that stuff. Remember. But when he is doing this, the thing I want you to always look for is look for deviation from baseline. We know his baseline is he's demonstrative when he's telling you stuff that's happened. Will was on the set. He was an actor. He was a director. All those big movements and that brow movement and all of that, we expect when someone's telling the truth, if that's what they were doing before. That changes. Listen to what happens. Those the Pay attention to his body. Those fingers that are usually doing this when he's telling you these stories are now down and narrow. And he adapts and he barriers. He's playing with his fingers. He's got his hands together and he's milling those fingers. That's what I call sacred space. I make a space where I feel safe and then I relieve, relieve nervous energy. He's illustrating at every turn with his fingers this way. He fishes with an, elong- an elongated make you, not make you, make you as he starts this whole story. This feels, again, like it's a whole lot of secondhand information. If it's true, it's secondhand information, but it has credibility. I think we're starting to see into his psyche and where I would lean in and go, oh, man, they must have mistreated you because he talks in a way that tells me that they discredited they will discredit you. They will burn you up. And I think that's the beginning of the unravel. People choose their words very carefully. He's so far off baseline, and he's even starting to turtle a little bit, that I think that one castaway line about they will discredit you is really the beginning of where I would start to fish. If I were interrogating, I'd lean in and say, how how'd they discredit you, man? Come on, just tell me. Let's talk about that a little bit. If I were talking to him, if I were interviewing Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look, I mean, Scott, it, it's not going to be the, the type of interview that you'd like, because this is an interview that is designed to sell wine. That's that's what it's there yeah, to right, do. Right. Uh, sell a book, and we'll hear about the book uh, in, a, in a bit, and what's around all of that. And, and I think we're going to find out, I definitely uh, would suggest that we will find out a little bit later what has upset him, and and who he believes has um, uh, has pushed him out of the circle. He's not allowed to be around a certain table 
uh, with everybody else uh, anymore. So, so there is some anger, I think, around uh, around that. Um, okay. So, by the way, the wine, um, Witching Hour. So that's a nice, nice idea. Given that his book is is called. Uh, Will Smith, Demonic Circle. Will Smith, Demonic Circle by Brother Bilal uh, is the book that will come out uh, at some point, which is what he's trying to, um, you know, push out at the moment while the interviewer is pushing out uh, a wine called Witching Hour. Uh, I couldn't find out who the who is responsible for manufacturing this wine. It seems to be quite a quite a quite a heavily kept secret. That particular wine is is a is a complete uh, Cab Franc, I, I, I think. Oh no, sorry, Cab Cab Sauvignon. They actually make a wine which is which is a blend of five different wines, which is actually quite hard to you know find. You know that that they, somebody would take five different Californian wines and stick them all together in one bottle for the price of around about ten dollars. Anyway. She's hacking that down. And why not? Why not? I see no problem in that. But we need to understand exactly why this show is as it is, because we need to keep people there watching uh, this person drink that wine, because that wine is paying for all of this to happen. And what that wine hopes is that other people will go, you know, I quite fancy a bottle of that wine. And they choose that wine over another wine. That's why the sensationalism. Um, So, so look, uh, Scott, we got at the start of this single shoulder shrug and the head went to one side as well, Uh. right at, right at the start of this. And I I, personally, I found that lovely to catch because I was like, ah, that, that's something that Scott, talks talks about and so in my mind i instantly went what we're about to hear from now on could be an absolute truckload it could be an absolute barrel full and i haven't heard anybody else suggest that we've had a whole lot of you know truth during this part so once more uh once more another notch there on the possibility of that single shoulder shrug and head to one side being an indicator that um, insincerity is about to come. Uh, look, he said in, in rehab, if you want to be, you've got to go to rehab if you want to be in their circumference. So there is something here about being in the circle. So it is interesting that he has this book about now the demonic circle so he's making this circle bad and so i'm now thinking what are the other circles that he's not part of who is in charge of that circle and who does he feel has pushed him out of that circle and let's look for any indicators of of those there may be some some witchy characters who pushed him out of the circle chase what do you got on this one it, this is a long one, but there's one thing in here I think you can really learn from. Remember, a lot of what can be seen in deception is when there are stakes involved. So, for instance, if I showed you a picture of a duck and I told you to tell somebody that you're looking at a picture of a horse, you're not going to show all these deception indicators. Like somebody says, oh, well, there's let me, let's pay two truths and a lie. There's no stakes to that game. If I did the same thing with a picture of a duck, and if you can't be convincing to that other person, you have to pay me $10,000, your behavior changes because the stakes have been modified. There's one question that she asks him here that really raised the stakes for him personally. And she says, did Duane ever come to you? This is the most massive change that we see in all of the videos we're going to be looking at here. So far, there's a huge deviation from baseline. There's emotional accessing this down into his right eye movement into an emotional processing area for a prolonged period, an increase in bodily tension. There's that single shoulder shrug uh, that Mark was talking about, which we'll dig into. But then the hands instantly shift to more close. They close down. Then the thumbs shoot upward. This is just in response to this question within like three seconds. Then there's eye movement all over the map as he's trying to answer. And when we see a single shoulder shrug, Mark was talking about it, you should ask yourself one question. 
is this person's response one that a reasonable person in the situation would be confident and direct in their ability to answer? Because if I say, well, how many jelly beans are in that jar over there? And somebody goes, I don't know, 75? That's not, you're not seeing real deception there. You're seeing a lack of confidence in somebody's answer. So just think about that. So the incomplete nature of the gesture, just using one shoulder instead of both, can symbolize a lack of full commitment, a lack of certainty, self-doubt, some insecurity. This little emotional accessing is also really telling. So science doesn't fully support it uh, yet, but I think after tens of thousands of hours of doing this and seeing what Greg uh, showed me several years ago, this is pretty damn reliable, especially when it's out of baseline. So it occurs in a giant cluster. It's also down and to the right, which we associate with emotional recall. So remember, we always talk about not relying on single pieces of nonverbal behavior. And I say this because uh, where there's only really one big giant mountain here, it's pretty ambiguous and this is why you should be looking for clusters of behavior so changes clusters and context are the three most important things to understand in behavior even more important than knowing all of these techniques and tactics can i spot change can i see changes in a cluster am i able to weigh that against a context that's more important than learning all of these little blink rate things do those three things first if you're ever studying behavior it, in my opinion anyway one of those tape replays and will has because she has all these things on will that he has to be a puppet. Like what? Like, is it the homosexual? I mean, no. Well, I've, well, we already dispelled that. Did y'all? Did you and Will ever have closure conversation no, on well, that? No, since heck, the, heck, no. I'm not having no. Heck, no. There wasn't no closure. Did Dwayne Martin ever try to come to you and talk no, to you? I, I did, listen, because see, here's here's the thing. When you're dealing with a real cat, it's just like I don't listen. That's y'all thing. Like, I'm not gay bashing Will. I feel that Will should just come out. Right. Because it's going to eventually come out. My problem is Will is hurting more people protecting his secrets. Right. Because you're trying to hot all these things and you're building up just you're hurting so many people to try to hide what you're doing. So, for example, okay. let's say like the new this is what Jada makes the new people do. And I ain't going to say no. They probably been there after myself. Mm -hmm. Right. It's they will make you check into a rehab. And they'll pay for the rehab. Even though you're not on drugs, they're going to pay for the rehab. And you have to go if you want to work with them, right? Or be in their circumference. Then they're going to say, hey, we need you while these cameras rolling to go in there and, and take some money out of our pocket. You know, we left some money in the coat pocket. Go in the room. The cameras is going. Go in there and take that money out. Right? Do they know the cameras is going? Yeah, they're telling them because this is the setup that if they hire you or when they hire you, if you decide that you want to expose something, oh, we they're going to discredit you. Oh, this person's a junkie. We love them, but we had to pay for their rehab. We got... You know, we got video of them stealing money out of our pocket. You know, they'll tell you, hey, give you your credit card. Go shopping. Go get yourself some, you know, some sneakers, a jacket, a hat, you know, high end, you know. And, and, yeah. And then Jada will report the credit card stolen, but they won't press charges. So if you ever try to give information on Will or Jada, they automatically discredit you. So now it's like, why do you think people don't speak up? Why are not people speaking up? They can get a bag. I know what I'm offered for book deals. I know what I'm being offered. Right. So it's it's the discredit game. If they clear to break their NDA, they're going to be say, oh, man, this person is a junkie. Then, you know, they're going to have some sexual acts on you. They, it's it's all kind of stuff they do. This is why people don't come forward. This is why people don't come forward. Why can't people just be real? When did you find out about Will and Jada separating? Oh, yeah, I already knew that. So, all right, this is another thing that takes so long to unpack, but I'm, I'm, I'll make it quick. And and this is going to be very devastating, but just follow along with okay. me. And, and I, I ask your listeners to just listen to it slow and clear. Mm hmm There already been problems 
and Will and Jada's relationship with um, Jada's attitude and disrespect of Will Mm -hmm. and her um, committing uh, adultery with multiple men. Now, be it that they share sexual partners sometimes where other people call it swinging or whatever, but in Will's mind, you know, that's, that's an understanding that they have. So if they choose to bring in another man or another woman in their relationship, that, that where after that's done, that's where it ends. Right. Um, and Jada would go outside of that, of having sex with other people. And that would destroy, um, Will, right? And, you know, when Jada goes into her rants on Will, you know, she tells him he got a little and all, like, that begins to chip at a man's soul. That hurts. Like, though, it's like getting, like a slave getting whipped for your woman to say that you can't please her or, you know. Well, according you, to you, you saw her say that Will Smith had a small. Oh, yeah. Oh, when she did. Get- Listen, a lot of people have, I mean, Jada has said worse. Right. Jada has said worse because she's out of control and will cannot control her. You understand what I'm saying? So um, and at this point, you know, I would have conversations with Will and I see the decay. I'm not working with him at this time, but I'm still his friend. I'm at all the events. You you can look on Instagram, hugging me, be this my guy, all this kind of stuff. Right. But I know not to say nothing because years ago I tried to say, yo, this chick is playing like you a trick. Like I didn't say it like that, Mm -hmm. but essentially I'm saying, Will, like, you know, you buying a Ferrari, shopping sprees, getting private jets. And you just came from being bankrupt and you're trying to impress this girl and about to go through a divorce. And you spending all this money trying to impress this chick that's from Baltimore. That's obviously promiscuous. Like, dude. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. Well, have I got on this one? Um, yeah. So here's what happens in this one. Uh, he has to frame for us exactly how we're going to listen to this. Um, uh, because it's going to take a long time to unpack. And so we've got to listen slow and clear. So it, it's rather, I mean, it, in many ways, it's rather like Mil- Will Smith. I think he says, look, you know, this is complicated. And he, and, he, and he frames and it's like, I can handle it. We'll be okay. We've got our bottle of wine. We're going to be all right. We've got a long time on this. I think we're going to be out. If you have facts for us, if they are laid out in any kind of comprehensible way, we're probably going to get this one. So just go for it. You don't need to tell us how to listen, how to think, how to feel around this. And because he does, and he hasn't in the past, I think the the shed load of what he's got is going to get deeper and deeper at this point. If he's trying to instruct us now, exactly like this is going to get complicated. You're going to have a hard time with this one. You better listen, you know, long and hard to this. I know what's coming is going to be an absolute load. And then he steeples with that as well. Barriers and shows us this is how confident I am about what I'm about to deliver. I think what's going to come is a complete load of nonsense. But I'm willing to have my mind changed on that. Uh, Chase, change my mind, if you'd like. I don't think I can. Uh, But uh, (laughs) in in here, we're definitely seeing a crafted narrative. And think about the difference between the personal stakes that are involved here. So he's not facing a lot of personal stakes uh, if he's proven wrong. So he's not going to jail. He's not trying to defend his own innocence. So that's one of the reasons you're not seeing a lot of deception clusters here. It's very, uh, it's very carefully designed to be an attack. Uh, To his credit, he somehow uses empathy here during what he, I think, during what has all the hallmarks of a smear campaign. The, The empathy, though is from a perspective of showing how noble and smart and observant and mature he is. So maybe that's the empathy is just what's designed to do. He's using the empathy to show you all of those things because he's building himself up, pushing someone else down. 
And that's what we call a zero sum thinker type of human being. Like I can't succeed unless someone else fails. You know, the reason I'm a failure is because people succeeded. That's a zero sum thinking process. So as promised, I'm only going to point out clusters and not uh, individual things. So the stakes need to be higher. So I ignore most of the things where there's no changes in clusters. I can say, yes, 100%. This is a crafted narrative. I don't see a lot of deception clusters in this video, though. Scott? Yeah, I agree with you. This, this, like you were saying, Mark, this whole thing set up to deliver a specific message as, as the whole thing is. But here, I think he's going for his, or who he's under the impression is the demographic that's going to buy his book. Because when he says uh, there had already been problems with Will and Jada's relationship, he looks right down the barrel at the camera. He, he just looks right, because I think that's where he said, this is it. This is what they're interested in. What are What is this demographic interested in? this, this, and this, and the marriage, what's really happening with that? What problems are they having? That's what interests his demographic. I think that's why he does that. So, so it's sort of, and that slowing down and doing all that stuff, everything changes there. His volume gets lower. He slows down. He brings it all to a halt, like he's getting ready to do some prayer about something. It's just odd looking. It's odd behavior. It, it's, it's just, you cluster that stuff together, and you just go, holy smokes. It becomes, in my perspective from my perspective it becomes obvious there what's going on because you know if you're going to make such a scene about giving the information where before you've almost you've you've ramped up and told all this stuff this was thought out this is the big one for him i think so that because he thinks that's what's going to connect with his, his demographic and then when he starts describing things he says um to run wheel down he, he immediately goes into what happens when you do that his cadence slows down. His everything again. Everything gets smaller. Everything gets get gets tiny. This is this is stuff he's made up. It sounds like a little kid telling a story. He talks about how he's friends with Will and how he's on Instagram and he's talking about him and and they're talking together. They're friends. And Will Will is not in those videos he's showing. Will's not mad at him. Not even a little bit. We'd be able to tell when something you're faking something like that. They're just hanging out having a blast. So whatever it was either happened after that, if it has happened since that or before that video, Will's not aware of it. He doesn't look like he's angry and he definitely wouldn't be hanging out with him and, and letting him be on his Instagram thing and 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 making him look good. No. It did not, it's falling apart, I think, here. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, Chase, I think something that we need to point out we always say there are really no indicators of deception, just indicators of stress. I see a hell of a lot of indicators of stress here. Now, let's think about why that stress could be occurring. Let's, I'm going to run down a list, and it's going to be a long one. His blink rate increases at the beginning of the conversation. I see his eyes start to flutter. One eyebrow is now up. That's new. He has not done that yet. One eyebrow is up. We typically associate that with skepticism, but it can be something else in people, too. We just don't know. He does lip withdrawal just before he says she committed adultery. Interesting. Does that mean she didn't commit adultery? Does that mean he's afraid to say it? Does that mean there's something else? How he'll be perceived? Don't know, but something has changed. His cadence shifts, and now he's got uhs in there. We haven't heard him say uh yet, but he does. Something's changed. Then he goes back out the baseline. He starts raising his hands again. She misses a great question. When he says, that's what's going on in Will Smith's mind, not one of us is a mind reader. How the hell does he know what's going on in the guy's mind? Did the guy tell him, hey, here's how I feel? That sounds like a bold statement. And the hard question is when you lean in and say, how do you know that? Who told you that? Did Will Smith tell you that? That guy would then kind of jack up. I think he's trying to pass that one by. It floats right by. And then she does ask a hard question, a very hard question. We said, you saw her say this? about him, about his body and, and you know how about him being bad in bed and that kind of thing. He redirects almost immediately. He does a redirect just poo. oh listen, a lot of people have. And then there's a great cluster right in here. Jada has said worse. Now that's a redirect. A lip withdrawal needs approval. At the same time, his brow rises and he says, right. We saw him do that in the conspiracy theory thing before. Then you see a genuine grief muscle as he starts to talk about genuine, I mean, you, can, you can't miss it, as he starts to talk about what he told Will Smith about Jada. I think what we're seeing is he feels 
jilted somehow out of the relationship. Bad things could be happening to Will, and he's not part of it to be there to tell him. And then that final thing is a chin tuck and his mouth strung as you hear him talking about her being promiscuous because you can hear his mouth. That's a lot of stuff, which tells me we're seeing the most stressful moment of the entire interview. Doesn't mean he's lying. It means it's the most important thing he's trying to deliver. And I agree with you there, Scott. What is that message? It sure sounds like he feels like he's been edged out somewhere. Mark, back to something you said, I think, in the last video. Really good indicator. One of those tape replays. When did you find out about Will and Jada separating? Oh, yeah, I already knew that. So, all right, this is another thing that takes so long to unpack, but I'm, I'm, I'll make it quick. And and this is going to be very devastating, but just follow along with okay. me. And, and I, I ask your listeners to just listen to it slow and clear. Mm -hmm. There have already been problems in Will and Jada's relationship with... Um, Jada's attitude and disrespect of Will mm -hmm. and her um, committing uh, adultery with multiple men. Now, be it that they share sexual partners sometimes, what other people call it swinging or whatever, but in Will's mind, you know, that's that's an understanding that they have. So if they choose to bring in another man or another woman in their relationship, that that where after that's done, that's where it ends, right? Um, and Jada would go outside of that of having sex with other people, and that would destroy um, Will, right? And you know when Jada goes into her rants on Will, you know she tells him he got a little and all like that begins to chip at a man's soul that hurts like though it's like getting like a slave getting whipped for your woman to say that you can't please her or you know well, according you, to you you saw her say that will smith had a small oh yeah oh when she get listen a lot of people have i mean jada has said worse right jada has said worse because she's out of control and will cannot control her you understand what yeah. I'm saying? So, um, and at this point, you know, I would have conversations with Will and I see the decay. I'm not working with him at this time, but I'm still his friend. I'm at all the events. Yeah. You, you can look on Instagram, yeah. hugging me, be this my guy, all this kind of stuff, yeah. right? But I know not to say nothing because years ago, I tried to say, yo, this chick is playing. Like, you a trick. Like, I didn't say it like that, mm -hmm. but essentially I'm saying, Will, like... You know, you buying a Ferrari, shopping sprees, getting private jets, and you just came from being bankrupt, and you're trying to impress this girl, and about to go through a divorce, and you spending all this money trying to impress this chick that's from Baltimore that's obviously promiscuous. Like, dude, this has already been out there, but I can confirm it. So, Jay, when when they did Hearthorn, Jada started with uh, Mark Anthony who is J-Lo's husband, right? And they did a, a TV show called Hawthorne. Is that why they divorced? So if you... So Jennifer I, Lopez and Mark yeah, Anthony? Yeah, so, I, 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 so let, me, let me go a little bit Okay, deeper. go ahead. Let, let's, go, let's go a little bit deeper. So this is a full-on relationship on the set, like romantic relationship, not, okay, I just gave him some and, you know, it, that's it. Like, it's, it's a relationship. Um... So, you know, Will hears about this and kind of devastated at this point. This is where you see all, I mean, all the papers are going crazy. A divorce is intimate and so forth and so on. The final straw is when Will came home and caught Jada, um, Mark Anthony on the couch at their home. Right. And this devastated Will. <laughs> Right. I even had a conversation when a will wanted to kill itself. Mm -mm. Right. Be no yeah. Well, well, here, oh. well, 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 here's the thing. When they're together, Will's comfortable with that. Will's comfortable with someone and his wife when he's there is when he's not there is the insecurities because I can't tell you why. But I'm, I can tell you that there's a comfortability when men and women come in to have sex with them. Will's fine with that. 
So when this happened, like Will kind of went crazy. Um, you know, they would talk about the divorce rumors and so forth and so on. It was a big crisis management. Um, many people tell you Will was driving around California. I mean, just he's gone. Um, he brought the way in a club called Zen Lounge and Will would come in there and just be drinking and like just this, this wasn't the Will. And one of the things that J- Jada has over him, Will lost it and beat the out of Jada. I mean, beat the dog out of her. That so bad that they had to make a makeshift hospital in their home so that it couldn't get out to the public. So that that pain of Will seeing Jada and Mark Anthony on their couch in their home, right? Because he knew they were on the, the, the set. This is, th- this is fact. Um, he just couldn't take it and he whipped her ass so much that she had to get face surgery and everything. If you look at her face, you could see where she had surgery around um, her cheeks and all that stuff. All right, Chase, what do you got? It's a lot more of the same. We see stress markers in some areas here. It's a lot more about social belonging, feeling outcast. And we're back to those three words that I had you write down in video one, that social belonging and status. And that's all I got for this one. Greg? Yeah, the thing that I notice here is his cadence is out of baseline. He's got pauses in here again. Now something he's navigating. And when I say navigating, when a person slows down their cadence and their word pattern shifts, usually an indicator of thinking about where they're going. He avoids the question. When he's asked about um, the divorce of J-Lo and Mark Antony, he says he doesn't answer that question. He is slick. He waits until she says, she um, she um, goes back and conditions her question and explains what she was asking. She mentions their names and he goes, yeah, he doesn't say that's why they got divorced. He answers a second question, which allows him off the hook. His hands are now flat on the table. Where'd that come from? We haven't seen any of that up to now. And then he comes to this whole thing about coming home and catching on the couch. And that's not firsthand. And then listen as he gets to his theory. He's back to conspiracy theory. I'm going to let you pick them out and tell me which ones he's fishing for with the right as he's locking down his anchor points or his aiming stakes. And then here's another one where you could ask, did you ask Will what he thought or are you just making that up? Is that just something you came up with? Because it sure sounds like something you just came up with. He lowers his voice. He's back down to the right. He's claiming things he does. He's claiming things that he's saying without telling you how he knows. When I have anybody I'm talking to on hearsay and we're back to cul-de-sac rumors, just say, who told you that? How'd they know? When they see it, that changes everything because people spread rumors because people's lives are small and they got nothing to do. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so like everything in life, there's a window, there's a tolerance, there's an envelope of of reasonable. So I'm going to talk again about baton gestures. These are the gestures that might conduct along to the rhythm of your speech just as I did there. And we've seen some good baton gestures from him in the past that would cause us to go, look, I think this is an honest thing. You know, Will was making a film. Okay. However, there's an envelope of being reasonable with this. When he says they had to make, sorry, they had to make a a makeshift hospital. He battens on every syllable of that. I can't even do it. My brain can't even put that together to batten on every single syllable. It's so emphatic. It's so emphatic that he's protesting too much. He wants us to believe this too much that they made a makeshift hospital. I would go hospital or hospital and land on the the end of it or at the start hospital. That would be me because I'd know it was the truth, a makeshift hospital. I'd know it was the truth, not a makeshift hospital. It's beyond. It's beyond. It's abject nonsense. Scott, what do you have? Anytime you get famous people together, be it on a movie, a TV show, whatever, they're hanging out, there are always rumors. And you always hear these things that get loose and, oh, here's what happened. I saw so-and-so do it. And those things grow bigger and bigger and bigger as more people tell the story. We all know that thing where you'll tell some, you know, as a kid, you'll have a big line of people and you'll say, I'll tell them, you know, a little sentence. And by the time it gets down to the other end of the of the line, that person says it out loud. It's nothing, you know, 
even similar to what you said at the beginning of it. It's completely different. And it shows you the example of how things change as you tell them. One time, my uh, brother lives in Los Angeles and he writes uh, TV shows and movies. And he hangs out with some pretty big hitters as far as uh, famous people go. I'm just telling you that because one time we had Thanksgiving at his, his house and this really famous person came over. And we're all we're all eating and, and having the best time. And this person has just gotten divorced not long before this. And when we, you know, we took our the pictures, hey, you know, it's Thanksgiving. We took our the regular Thanksgiving pictures you take and all that, right? They leave, this person leaves. Two days later, we're at Ralph's. That's the grocery store there in, in Los Angeles. And I look over at the, at like National Enquirer, one of those things, and it says, and I'll just call this person so and so. So and so spent Thanksgiving with their ex, so and so at their ex, so and so's house for Thanksgiving, and it showed him coming out of my brother's house, saying like, "Oh, look what we found!" So, anytime you get people together, you're gonna get, these people make things. They everybody out there makes things up, and they make things up to make them sound more powerful, like they're in, like they're doing this and doing that, when they're actually not. You know, it's just part of that the process where you go through and make stuff up to make you sound more important. Like you've done all these things and you really haven't done them. And this is what he's doing to make him sound more important. As he's saying, he's hanging out with Will and all these people and doing these things so he can sell more books. I really think that's what's going on here. This is this, this section here for me is just, it's gossip. He's just, you know, like you were saying earlier, Greg, I'm sure if some of this stuff happened, he wasn't there. He just heard it. And he's parroting what he heard. Transference. That's the uh, the thing you came up with, Greg, the, the type of lie. The extra lie I think we ought to add on to the um, list of lies is transference. Because he's he's just telling something that he's heard. Telling somebody else, here's what happened. And that's not what happened at all. One of those tape replays. This has already been out there, but I can confirm it. So, Jade, when, when they did Hawthorne, Jada started with uh, Mark Anthony who is J-Lo's husband, right? And they did a, a TV show called Hawthorne. Is that why they divorced? So if you... So Jennifer I, Lopez and Mark yeah, Anthony? Yeah, so, I, 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 so let, me, let me go a little okay, bit Okay, go ahead. Let, let's, go, let's go a little bit deeper. <laughs> so this is a full-on relationship on the set, like romantic relationship, not, okay, I just gave him some and, you know, it, that's it. Like, it's, it's a relationship. Um... So, you know, Will hears about this and kind of devastated at this point. This is where you see all, I mean, all the papers are going crazy. A divorce is intimate and so forth and so on. The final straw is when Will came home in court, Jada, um, Mark Anthony on the couch at their home. Right. And this devastated Will. <laughs> Right. I even had a conversation when a will wanted to kill itself. Mm -mm. Right. Not Be even a yeah. Well, well, here, oh. well, 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 here's the thing. When they're together, Will's comfortable with that. Will's comfortable with someone and his wife when he's there is when he's not there is the insecurities because I can't tell you why, but I, I can tell you that there's a comfortability when men and women come in to have sex with them. Will's fine with that. So when this happened, like Will kind of went crazy. Um, you know, they would talk about the divorce rumors and so forth and so on. It was a big crisis management. Um, many people tell you Will was driving around California. I mean, just he's gone. Um, he brought the way in a club called Zen Lounge and Will would come in there and just be drinking and like just this, this wasn't the Will. And one of the things that Jada has over him, Will lost it and beat the out of Jada. I mean, beat the dog out of her. That so bad that they had to make a makeshift hospital in their home so that it couldn't get out to the public. So that that pain of Will seeing Jada and Mark Anthony on their couch in their home, right? Because he knew they were all on the, the, the set. This is, this is fact. Um, he just couldn't take it and he whipped her ass so much that she had to get face surgery and everything. If you look at her face, you could see where she had surgery around um, her cheeks and all that stuff. Will don't want that to get out there. 
This is another thing. How did you find out about him? I talked to Will. Will was a basket case. Will was a damn basket case. Like I told you, his lover, Dwayne Martin, is, and anybody can show, see it on the records. That club was owned by Will. That's what I'm saying. I go, these private investigators brought me everything, everything to support what I am saying. So that lounge, Dwayne Martin said he owned, it was owned by Will. Will brought him that. The Bentley, Will brought him that. The home he lived in, Will gave him the money. Boom. Uh, some of the roles that Dwayne Martin got, Will called BET to get him on there. Like, this is factual stuff. We're not dealing in speculation. I'll let everybody else speculate because they're not from the inside. You know, I'm from the inside giving you the information to the outside. So, you know, um, that's when she gained su supreme control over Will. And as you see, she put the t so she got rid of all of the the top guys around Will, Will, you know, that were real friends and replaced them with her people. If you look at Jada, she got her mom and all her friends with her, a big teams of people because Will don't want to be known as a woman beater. And he beat the shit out of her and wanted to kill himself at this point. But I'm not saying that I can don it, but I can see how a man coming home and seeing his wife on the couch and you you trying to do everything in your power to please this woman at some point you got to know and understand that you cannot please Jada and you become complicit in the way she treats other people even myself all right Greg what do you got so we talked about lip withdrawal and you know you needing to be reassured watch the amount of lip withdrawal this guy does on this one and I talked about aiming stakes in a, in a conspiracy theory. When he's going out and saying everything I'm saying, he's testing his facts. And his facts might be true, but they're still circumstantial. Hey, Will Smith gave this guy this. Doesn't mean Will Smith was having sex with this guy. That's a, that's a correlation. That's a big swing to take that correlation. Then he's back to balled up hands he had in the Dwayne story. Now, could it be that he's feeling like he's really in trouble when he balls his hands up and does that? Yeah, it could be. But we have seen him using his hands to illustrate other things. And then when he gets right down to the crux of any of the three big heavy hitting issues, his hands ball up, he pulls back away. Then he says all the factual stuff. I call those push-pull words. When a person says factual, I'll go, well, as opposed to what? Non-factual? Tell me about which ones you use that were not factual. And we, we call those qualifiers. But push-pull will give you how an interrogator thinks because we can go after it. Um, just a second. So that when I say that, that's some of these things are for you. For you at home, I want you to think about how you can talk to somebody. When I say factual, pay attention. Don't say, well, as opposed to not factual, that's not the way you would do it as an interrogator or as at home. That's the way an interrogator would do it. You might say, like, which facts? You know, I, I've been paying attention. Maybe I missed something. And you're putting them on notice that they're full of shit and you know it. Excuse my English. You have to bloop me there. But you're putting them on notice that they are full of it and that you are going to question them without actually doing it. So I, I don't want you to sound like an interrogator. I want you to sound like a person saying, hey, I, I, I must have missed those facts. Help me out with those. This is more conspiracy theory stuff. I'm not saying any of this is true. Could all be true, but he has not given significant facts to indicate any of this is true. And when he did give us facts, his everything about his demeanor changed. He balled up, his baseline changed, and that's what we look for, clusters of behavior changes to tell us that something's up. Still could be true. We don't know. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look, and and we're not really going to get the interview here that would get us closer to that truth. Right. And why not? Because this show is about selling $10 bottles of wine. Nothing wrong with that, because this person is doing a great job at holding our attention around this $10 bottle of wine. And i got no problem with a $10 bottle of wine. I will drink with you a $10 bottle of wine all day, every day, no problem at all. But we have to understand if that's what you're doing, you need a certain type of content in order to engage people. And this content is doing a good job of that. So we get, um, how did you know from the interviewer, which is a good question. How did you know? Decent question. I talked to Will. He was a basket case. Well, 
what doesn't happen is any follow up on so what exactly did will say to you what the the interview gets stuck on is the emotional state of will being a basket case so we've got away from so what did you say when was that said take me through it there's no uh, delving into that there's just an understanding of He's he's absolutely nutty. He's absolutely off his rocker. That's all we need to know. Knock back another swig. Let's keep on going. So doesn't doesn't really get away from state of mind. And then we get that he that he gets private investigators who bought him everything to support this. So we, I mean, who were these? Who were they? How? What methodology did they use? Like, how much did it cost? How long was their process? Uh, were they looking for things to support, or were they looking for everything? And then you took from that what was supporting. Did they have a bias or not have a bias? So look, it, it's not it's it's not it's not good, but it's it's good for selling this particular wine, I think. Then we get, I think, the most important thing that we see in all of these videos which is a, a signal of disdain and disgust at Jada's team replacing Will's friends. That's the cru crux of this. This person is not in the inner circle anymore. Jada, according to him, has thrown out Will's friends. Could be true, could be not true. I just, I don't know about that. But what I do know is this really bothers him why might it bother him well to your point Craig you know if that's if that's what he's hinged himself to and this person's going down like he needs to be part of that he needs to be part of that in a in a big way to keep on earning maybe money but maybe some kind of cachet or respect just as you were saying chase status and he's not in that status anymore he's outside of that circle he's not around the red table so therefore he has to come up with a different red table which is this demonic circle and you'll see that on the front of his book, a big red circle with the pentagram in there to say these people are demonically bad and, and I'm now pushing myself outside of that on purpose. I wasn't pushed. I took myself out of this. I think that's his, that's his situation. He's upset that he's not in that, whether he was in the first place, because it's hard to find, I couldn't really find much evidence in anything that he was saying or anything that I can find elsewhere, well, a cursory glance that says he was a best friend of Will. I can't, and Will doesn't even seem to say that about him in any of the literature that Will Smith, I mean, maybe he's the best kept secret of, of, of friendship, and I don't understand why a friend would throw you under the bus like this, but maybe that's what people do. Um, I'm, 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 I don't get it though. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Can I go last? Can you go last? Sure. Yeah, you can do. Uh, Scott, therefore, what do you got? All right. Uh, people get buy people with that kind of money. They'll buy people restaurants. They'll buy people clubs. They'll, there's nothing that big a deal about saying you not saying you bought a club for somebody or, or something when you have, when you're living that kind of financial lifestyle, that's not that big a deal. It happens all the time. It's very, it's very common. He makes this huge deal about it. Like it means something really big, <laughs> like, like it has something to do with anything. If one of these things, if he'd come out with one of these stories, just one, it had been so much more believable. It had been a Bigfoot story or a UFO story or a ghost story. It had been one of the three. When you come out, when you when you come out with this barrage of stuff, it's it's just a smear campaign. It's just one thing right after the other, and everything is bigger than the next. Thing. Well, not everything. It was pretty big there, close to the top. There it was a pretty big one. But there's so many things that, that, for example, TMZ wouldn't miss some of the stuff. You can't keep this stuff hidden or quiet. Too many people talk. Like this guy's talking, but they talk amongst themselves. You don't they don't write a book or whatever. You don't think TMZ would have said, Hey, I heard this. Let's check, hey fellas, go check this out. Let's see what's going on. And come up with something or somebody get busted doing something and all that? No. 
they would somebody would have found out this is this story he's telling or all these stories put together is is a ufo story it's a bigfoot story it's an elvis sighting elvis sighting story because it's and it compares to this it's like a ufo yeah that's what it is it's like if you saw a ufo liberace was driving it and then elvis was pushing crates of bigfoots out the back of it that's what this is it's this thing it's just crazy sounding when you put them all together one would have might have been okay you might you might have gotten away with the one, but one after the other after that that may be common knowledge among you know people in in Hollywood or whatever, but that's a whole lot of big stuff. With with nothing really to back it up, but his what he's saying because he was on the inside, and let everybody else you know on the outside they don't know what I know because I was on the inside. And you're right, Mark. There's some things on Instagram where they're palling around a little bit, but. It doesn't look like best friend stuff to me either, you know. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Or Chase, what do you got? You're going last. Yeah, so Greg, to your point, and I wanted to go last because I'm going to send everybody off into this clip uh, with some really cool 3D X-ray goggles to listen to this clip in a completely different way than you ever would have before. Uh, and Greg, to your point about being at maybe at a reunion or a family gathering or something, the first thing that I teach in behavior profiling, number one, it's like on, I think it's the first slide, no matter if I'm training an intelligence operative group or I'm training a company, the first slide is see suffering first. That's the number one rule that I see or I use when I'm doing behavior profiling. Like, where's the suffering? that's coming from this person. So instead of me judging them, like I'm going to find the suffering first, I'll, maybe I'll judge later, but there's definitely going to be suffering first. I want to see what's coming out of this. So here is the secret message hidden within this clip. And I want you to, I'm going to go through a couple of little things here. just want you to listen to these. And when the clip comes on, I just want you to see this clip in a completely different way and hear it in a different way. Here's what's in the clip. I'm an understanding person. I'm a good guy. I tried to do the right thing. Everything in how I see the world is about who's on the inside and who is on the outside. That's just the way that I see the world. When I got left behind, it hurt and it hurt bad. And it was a betrayal that I should not have suffered. Will became complicit in how I was being outcast. And now that I'm kicked out of the circle, there's going to be repercussions. Here's what's the subtext of all of that. Why are there going to be repercussions? Because when someone goes through something that makes them feel outcast and not cared for at all, bad things happen. And those bad things are understandable and normal. And that's exactly what he says in this clip. If you just kind of paraphrase all of that, he legitimizes a reaction to being outcast. He tells like it was OK for Will to do some of these things because he was feeling outcast. So I also think we're hearing his re uh, rationalization strategy, uh, just how he's rationalizing his own behavior and why he's on this podcast in his mind. It's coming out through language. And this is exactly what's in this clip. My goal here was to give you kind of a superhuman hearing so that you start hearing between the lines. And that's all I want you to do. So here comes the clip. One of those tape replays. We don't want that to get out there. This is another thing. How she's did you a, find out about you? I talked to Will. Will was a basket case. Will was a damn basket case. Like I told you, his lover, Dwayne Martin, is, and anybody can show, see it on the records. That club was owned by Will. That's what I'm saying. I go, these private investigators brought me everything. Everything to support what I am saying. So that lounge, the Wayne Martin said he owned, it was owned by Will. Will brought him that. The Bentley, Will brought him that. The home he lived in, Will gave him the money. Boom. Uh, some of the roles that Dwayne Martin got, Will called BET to get him on there. Like, this is factual stuff. We're not dealing in speculation. I'll let everybody else speculate because they're not from the inside. You know, I'm from the inside giving you the information to the outside. So, you know, um, that's when she gained su supreme control over Will.
And as you see, she put the t- so she got rid of all of the the top guys around Will, Will, you know, that were real friends and replaced them with her people. If you look at Jada, she got her mom and all her friends with her, a big teams of people because Will don't want to be known as a woman beater. And he beat the shit out of her and wanted to kill himself at this point. But I'm not saying that I condone it, but I can see how a man coming home and seeing his wife on the couch and you you trying to do everything in your power to please this woman at some point you got to know and understand that you cannot please Jada and you become complicit in the way she treats other people even myself just one more thing all right Mark how's it looking to you so far at this point well look I like a good conspiracy theory as much as the next person and I like a good $10 $10 bottle of wine as much as the next person. I wouldn't be drinking this particular 10 bottle, a $10 bottle of wine. I don't know why. It doesn't appeal to me in some way. And I wouldn't be buying into this particular conspiracy theory. I don't know. It doesn't really appeal to me. But you might. You might like both of those, uh, you know, as they stand. I'm not buying either of those two things. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, if we go back to those three words from video one, those three words is social belonging and status. This is a campaign uh, behind a deep-seated feeling of betrayal and being outcast. It's an incredible display of how all of us uh, unknowingly do two huge things. Number one, we live and speak through archetypes. And we heard a character arc and a story arc in here with an archetype of a story and how somebody came back for revenge. We live this way. And the second the second thing, we unknowingly uh, reveal our own struggles, our suffering and our desires when we talk through things. It's woven into our language and we reveal a lot more about ourselves than we know just when we talk about stuff which is the whole purpose of this channel. Greg? Yeah, talking about stuff is what we do best. <clears throat> Let's talk about conspiracy theories, Mark, because I think I agree with you. Look, if you're going to cast aspersions on somebody, they need to be big, especially if there's rumors and you can tap into those rumors, then you get to create some real, real conspiracy. And let me give you a, just a little formula for watching somebody when they're weaving their conspiracy theory. What they're going to do is start with hard facts. If they can give you a hard fact, they're pinning you down so that you believe them. They've got a foundation. Once they get the hard facts in place, they'll swing for the fence with that aiming stake and see what's believable. Now, you have to watch their body language. When they swing for the fence, you might see this. You'll see them fishing for approval, elongated vowels. As they get that other stake in the ground, Chase, you talked about it earlier. What they do is give you that that, um, placebo for cleverness and let your brain fill in the path because your brain is designed to fill in paths. Once you do that, then all they have to do is keep stroking it. Scott, you were talking about it earlier. Not just that, but, and they just keep fanning the fire and fanning the fire. And that all can be believable if a person's allowed to say whatever they want and you can't see their body language. But if when they get to the hard facts, their hands ball up and their eyes break contact and their blink rate goes up, you should be suspicious. And now I've got no hard facts and I've got no aiming stake on the right, then the, the conspiracy theory falls apart. When you ask how a person knows, you'll find it. I think what we're seeing, I agree with you guys, you're somebody who's jilted as a friend and feels really, really hurt by it. So how do you best swing for the fence? Well, you make some money in the process. Could we all be wrong and there's all this is true? Sure, could be. And there's a ton of rumors around Hollywood. Anybody who knows somebody in Hollywood knows there's a ton of rumors around this couple. And we're seeing her, and she's wacky and hard to believe when she does her interviews. So who knows? Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you on that. I Again, I think if he'd come out with one story, that might have made it. The one might have gotten over the fence. But when you come out with this incredible barrage of this happened, this happened, this happened, guess what else happened? And it's just... It, it, it's a it's a smear campaign. He's mad about something. I don't know what it is. I could be wrong, but I think we'll find out. He's there's something's happened in there that's made him mad, and he's trying to get back at at all of them over there. So that, that's why it looks to me. It just looks impossible to all that to have happened like that. All right, fellas. Thanks for another good one. And 
I'll see you next time. So what do you got?